Hey y'all, I'm Morgan and thank you so much for clicking on my video. Welcome back to some of you and welcome to the new viewers. Today I wanted to talk about the new release For the Throne by Hannah Witten. This is the second in the Wilderwood duology that started with For the Wolf. And um, this is one of my June anticipated releases and so glad that I finally got to read it. Firstly, I'm sorry for the way I sound, uh, froggy and everything from being outside, sunburned, sinuses, me and outside just don't get along. But the book, uh, also sorry that I will probably mispronounce people's names throughout, it's just me and the way I pronounce them is probably not accurate. Overall, I really enjoyed it. It did everything I wanted it to do. The pacing was pretty good. It went really quickly. I only took like three days to read. Sometimes, of course, the pacing does slow down just a little bit. Uh, the tone of this book feels different as well, possibly due to where its location is set most of the time or just, you know, some events, which we'll talk about. I think, though, I'm going to give the book a 4.25 stars because I enjoyed it. I liked how it handled things like that I wanted it to do. But then there's also some times where you could definitely see things coming or events that you would be like, well, why would you have to make them do that? They didn't have to. You, you didn't need to. <sighs> so yeah, that's, um, that's why I was going to go with 4.25 stars. For those of you who haven't read the Wilderwood duology yet, though, of course, we should start with For the Wolf. So I'm going to talk about this just a little bit in case you haven't heard about this one either. For the Wolf is a Beauty and the Beast kind of retelling that also, I feel, has the Red Riding Hood vibes because her name is Redarius. The second daughter of this kingdom is always sacrificed to the wolf. And um, red is the second daughter's sacrificial color. Now, this goes back centuries to where the first, second daughter and wolf made a bargain with this magical wood that surrounds, well not surrounds, but borders the kingdom of Baldea, which they're from. They ran to the wood to bargain with it to seek safety from her father, the king, because, you know, they wanted to be together and she was in an arranged betrothal thing and they didn't want that to happen. So since then though, the wood has claimed the second daughters of the royal line to be its guardians. So no matter whether the people wanted to or not, the sacrifice became a have to do because the wood would magically take control of the girl and bring the girl to the wood. Like, super scary. It waits till their 20th birthday though, so she's not like a little girl. She's full grown, grown ladies. But our main character, Radarius, though, has fully accepted her fate. She doesn't try to fight it. She doesn't try to get out of it. She knows she's going to have to go to the woods and the wolf, which at this point in time, they think that, you know, the wolf is a monster, a creature. And um, as she gets there, though, she finds out he's just a man, uh, similarly aged to her, but actually centuries old because magic just stopped him from aging. Through the book, though, you get chapters with Red's perspective, and the other chapters are through her twin sister, Nevera's perspective and with Neve you are constantly seeing her struggle to you know live without her sister and think that she has to save her from the monster from the wood so she is doing everything she can to be able to bring her sister home and that creates most of the problems actually in the book and for Red and it's just it was a very good read okay if you haven't read this one yet then and you think it does sound interesting and you actually want to read the books, then you should probably stop here. I'm glad that I did read this one just a, a few months ago so I didn't have to wait that long for this one to come out. And it is, as I hoped, it is still showing from both twins' perspectives that this one does focus more on Neve and her going through her issues, trying to make up for the mistakes, kind of a, the decisions she made in the last book with her trying to save Red. I wanted to see kind of more of her personality than we got in the first one. The first one, it was a lot of her just trying to save her sister. And so it, most of what came off was just a very controlling, like she needed to have power and control to be able to get things done. And 
you can still see this coming across in this one. She's still trying to be very controlling and very queenly and, you know, keep her poise. Yeah, poise is probably the right word. Like, even though she's in a different situation, she has no idea what's going on. She's it's kind of scared, but, you know, she's not letting it show so much. Uh, with Red's perspective, though, like in the first one, Red was a very fierce and determined and um, fighting, not really against, you know, having to go to the wood, but she was fighting against, you know, dying. Cause she, she thought she was going to die when she went there, and she didn't want to, fighting against the Waterwood magic. But in this one, you see a lot more fierceness from Neve, which I guess is her story. But at the same time, all that fierceness that we saw from Red, it's just like dulled down. I don't understand it. You don't see the fighting of her. You see the desperation kind of, the need to save her sister. She's going to do anything to save her sister. But where's her fierceness? Where's her fighting spirit? Why is everything just sad and desperate? I don't get it. I don't get what they did to Red in this book. The tone of this one is also much different. The um, The first book, I feel like, was more kind of an adventure-ish type. And then this one seems slightly more questy type. Like, they Neve and Salomir, because she first wakes up, that's who she sees. She's super pissed about it. But they find out what they need to do to be able to get Neve home. And so they're journeying out to do that. I wouldn't say it's a journey story because the landscape hardly changes, but it feels questish here. And where they are in the Shadowlands is all monotoned, it's dark and gray, but I don't think that exactly is also what makes it feel like a darker story. In the first book, you know, there's a whole lot of bleeding on trees. This book, though, is a whole lot of um, stabbing and murder, so it just feels generally darker Maybe from where they are. Maybe from all the murder. Yeah. We're also introduced to a new queenly-ish character who I mostly liked her character. She brought something new as aspect kind of to the character dynamics and I think she helped the group a little bit. I didn't agree with some of the choices that was made with the character. That's for the spoiler section though. Through this one with Eve's quest to, you know, get back to Red that that is again the, what the sisters are doing through the whole book is trying to save each other get back to the other one that's the theme it's just it's kind of flip-flop from which sister believes the other one needs saving and how what they're doing and also trying you know not to let bad evil things into the world overall it was a very good story and um when i op first opened the box though i know i said i don't know how this one is special the barnes and nobles but i'll go ahead and show you the inside front cover has this illustration here and uh the back cover is also prettily illustrated and there is a special story in it of a prequel called for the wilderwood which does detail gaia and kieran the first second daughter and the first wolf when they escaped to the Waterwood and made the deal and it's just a real brief 18, 20 page short story and it's kind of sad. I suppose it's time for spoilers now so let's do that. The first one would definitely have to be about the foreshadowing in this book as it was barely foreshadowing. You kind of knew that something was going to turn into something because it was brought up several times. The constellations like the sisters and the far-flung queen. they I believe they talked about the stars a little bit in the first book. So you kind of heard, had heard the name about the constellation of the sisters before. But then from the beginning of this book, when Neve wakes up in the Shadowlands, and the first person that her and Salomir visit calls her the Shadow Queen. So you've heard her be called the Shadow Queen a lot. And then when Red and her group go to the edge and are looking at these uh, hieroglyphic type things that they had carved into the wall to remember their history because they didn't have enough paper and they start talking about the constellations and they mentioned that in the olden days the constellations the sister 
had also been called the Shadow Queen and the Golden Bane. And you're like, oh, light and dark themes. We're seeing it. We're, s yep. And it talks about how they have to be mirrors for the other. And they start hearing voices in their dreams. It brings up the constellations a few more times. And you're like, okay. Their love for each other. That one's the light, one's the dark. They have to cancel each other out. Somehow that's going to help bring her back to life. They're going to save the world. <clears throat> yeah, so that wasn't super a surprise because it had been brought up several, several times. And the addition of our third little princess queenly person, uh, Kaya, who turns out was actually someone distantly in line for the throne. Well, not even distantly. She's like third in line for the throne. And she came in because she had a letter from the old queen saying it was safe for her to come study in Valdea to get away from her father, who was trying to do an arranged marriage. But she just knew so much. She just knew all the right things of so much things. And you're like, okay, well, she's probably going to be someone who is going to traitorously do something. But you don't want her to. You're like, she's a good character. She doesn't have to be a traitor. And she doesn't per se. Like, she does a little bit, but it's not a big traitor thing. And it's not like she ever wanted to. She was kind of blackmailed into it. But you could also see that she was going to betray them because of the way the book started setting it up. It's like she went from joyous, happy, boisterous talking and questioning everything, you know, like, well, inquisitive questions about stuff, to being very reserved and quiet and, you know, she just acted different. Yep, that's a sign. That's a sign. Something's about to happen with that character. She's about to do something against the group. Another betrayal, though, that was written in the same manner as Kayo's. Kayo? Mm -mm. Let's just stop trying to say her name was Salomir's. Like, you, he's the bad guy, of course. He's the villain or whatever, but you wanted to root for him. Because he talked about, you know, keeping his soul intact no matter that he was using the evil magic. How hard he fought, how he wanted to be a good person, how he never wanted the bad things to happen. It was all for a bigger purpose, and he never meant for people to get hurt at first. But everything he was doing was to try to keep the evil from being in the world and it's just a bad set of circumstances that led him to being the villain of the piece and you see him fighting so hard against it and of course you see him falling for Neve and just you know he would let the whole world burn for her like he wouldn't he tried, didn't want to hurt her even if evil got out he was going to let it happen just so she wouldn't be hurt anymore but, leading up to his confession of, you know, love and whatever, he started being withdrawn. He wasn't even bickering with her or being their cutesy banter of snarkiness. It's just, he, yeah, you knew it was about to happen, the same as with the other character, because they were written into the same exact thing. If you're going to do betrayal with two different characters, you can at least write it a little bit differently. Let him be a little... Different. I mean, he's supposed to be the villain of the piece, right? So betrayal by making it a surprise. I mean, even if he was starting to fall for her, it could still be a surprise. Internal war with himself, but him outwardly acting the same. Really liked that we got more of our background, though, of what really happened centuries ago when the first pact with the Wilderwood was made and what the kings went through and how they became divinities, really. I still don't get how people outside the Shadowlands started worshiping them as gods because they really ascended to their godhood there in the Shadowlands with taking in all the corrupt magic. Also, with the whole Neve and Salomir bit, it's cute, sure, their personalities match, the cute bickering and enemies to lovers thing, but it didn't really have to happen that romance didn't have to be there they could have just she could have helped him you know save his soul realize his humanity 
without the romance. It could have just been friend thing. I don't know. Good companions. The end of the book, they're dealing with the consequences of the decisions that they made to kind of save the world. And it's very hard on Red, it seems, more than Neve. Neve has kind of accepted what the decision they made was. And she's like, well, it could be, as we said, in the Shadowlands, you know, it's a day-to-day -day choice of being good. And a soul can be lost or regain so that's her outlook on it but red is very much more emotional about it and she just yeah she seems to be struggling with that and i wish the sisters had talked more before neve went on her i'm gonna find out what my life is gonna be like trip now that she's not a queen anymore she's able to travel the land and finds out that she really likes going to taverns and actually drinking ale versus wine she's like Wine always gives me headaches, but ale is great. In the epilogue, you're a year later. I mean, you're seeing from both of their perspectives, and Red's kind of like on this vacation with Eamon, and they're still talking about it, and like you can really see that she's still struggling with all of that. Whereas Neve really seems to have grown more, seems to have learned more about herself, but yet still she has this issue with communicating, like what she wants or what she's feeling, and she still seems like she needs somebody else to tell her that she is a good person and her communication with Salomir there at the end as they run into each other again and it's like okay I really want to ask you if we can now travel together and see about being with you but I'm I know that's not for now let's just live in the moment in case it's ruined it's called communication all this self-growth and Learning that, you know, tramping down your feelings, tramping down your problems for another day, you saw how bad that was for you before. Why are you doing it again? So even though the book didn't have like that happy ever after, and I said that really they didn't even have to have the romance between them, it was okay. It was, it was nice, I suppose. You saw it happening. You saw it, the slow burn growing and everything. But... <sighs> Yeah, it didn't have to, and the fact that it's going to leave it all unresolved because she can't communicate what she wants or what she feels, apparently, it leaves that open-ended there, and that was the only problem I had with the end of the book. Otherwise, the issues with the world, the issues between the sisters, everything I feel like was tied up very nicely, very, very nicely, but this, but that that ending. Overall, I feel like this was a really good read, and it was a pretty fast read, obviously. And if you want to pick up this series, you can read both of them in a month or a few days, depending on how fast, you know, you go through books. I think this duology series is something that a lot of people would enjoy, because it's got your fantasy, it's got your action, your character growth, except for that one problem, you know. <laughs> uh, it's got a little bit of romance, but it's not overdone, and yeah, I think this is something that a lot of people can pick up and enjoy. Thank you guys so much for sticking with me while I talk about the Wilderwood duology. If you've read For the Wolf and are thinking about For the Throne, if you've read both of them and you liked or didn't like them, let me know in the comments down below. Or if you guys have any suggestions for something you think I would love to read, or books that you're looking at but you don't know for sure if you want to read it and you want to hear somebody else talk about it babble let me know and I can check it out I have other review videos bookish unboxings vlogs up that you can go check out on my channel and if you're liking the content here please consider subscribing and joining our small growing community I love reading fantasy books especially and I enjoy so much talking to you guys about them and just making this content for you guys. It's so much fun. <laughs> I hope that you guys are finding something awesome to read today and I will see you in the next one. Bye!